Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. During this talk, we will share with you one approach that we have taken at the University of British Columbia over the past decade to create institutional support for strengthening sustainability education across our campus and in our classrooms. So this talk is about 35 to 40 minutes long. And unfortunately, we won't be holding a live question and answer period following the talk because it is two o'clock in the morning Vancouver time. We do, however, encourage you to look at the documents shared on the conference platform to learn more about the program that we're describing today. And we will offer our emails at the end of the talk. So feel free to please uh, get in touch with any questions. So before we begin, we'd like to briefly introduce ourselves. So my name is Jean Marcus and I am the Director of Teaching, Learning and Student Engagement with the UBC Sustainability Initiative. I have worked in this role for over 10 years and I've ma managed our flagship faculty engagement program, the Sustainability Fellowship Program since it started in 2010. And I'm really delighted to be joined today by one of our former faculty fellows, Susan Nesbitt, and I'll hand it over to Susan now. Thanks, Jean. So it's great to be here. I'm a professor of teaching in the Department of Civil Engineering here at UBC, and I'm also the co-director of the Masters of Engineering Leadership in Urban Systems. My own research interest is in sustainability education for engineers, and it was my really my immense pleasure to be part of the inaugural Sustainability Fellows cohort. cohort. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I, I think I'm putting the cart before the horse. Well, let's start at the beginning, shall we, Jean? Sure, thanks so much, Susan. So let's just get ourselves situated first. So the University of British Columbia is a large research intensive university whose Vancouver campus in Western Canada is home to over 58,000 students, over 14,000 faculty and staff, and we offer over 4,600 courses a year at this campus. So we'd also like to acknowledge that we are joining you today from Vancouver, Canada, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. So we are extremely grateful to be able to work, learn, and play on these ancestral and unceded lands. And we know that many of you are joining us today from near and far, and we would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. So our talk today is structured into three parts. First, we'll introduce you to the relevant UBC plans and policies and strategies which support our work. Second, we'll provide an overview of the Sustainability Fellowship Program, including how it has evolved and changed over the last 10 years. And then third, we'll provide an overview of a study that we conducted a few years ago, which points to the impact of the fellowship program beyond the original goals it was originally designed to achieve. And then we'll end with some general recommendations for universities to consider when you are exploring how best to offer support within your own institution to weave sustainability education into the teaching and learning culture. This slide is to give you some UBC context. So since around 2008, there really was a, um, an intentional and concerted effort to align all university activities with centralized aspirational strategies generated from authentic and very broad consultation and invo involving UBC stakeholders, which included neighbors, traditional landholders and caretakers, alumni, staff, student, and faculty. Today, we have five strategic plans relating to sustainability, which you can see in front of you, all of which fit within the overarching university plan, which in its current form is called Shaping UBC's Next Century. We are here today to discuss our Sustainability Teaching Fellows Program and we, before we dive into the fellows program, we wanted to let you know that the program strongly aligns with two of the five strategies shown here, namely the sustainability academic strategy from 2009, and then the um, more developed 
a 20 year sustainability strategy from 2014. We wanted to actually focus just for our talk on the 20 year sustainability strategy. It is particularly pertinent because as you can see from the goals, it articulates, we have before us the prime directive to ensure that every student at UBC has the opportunity to learn about and apply sustainability knowledge. So that's the first, and actually it's the primary goal of the university in terms of sustainability. And I, I wanna underline that this is not a top-down directive, but rather it arises from a multitude of consultation forums that occurred across the campus and beyond in the 2009-2014 uh, period. So UBC's sustainability initiative, which is an administrative, not an academic unit, is charged with enacting our 20-year sustainability strategy. Great, thanks so much, Susan. So I'll just provide a little bit more detail about the UBC Sustainability Initiative. So as Susan mentioned, it's an administrative unit and we're situated within the VP academic portfolio. So we were created in 2010 uh, in large part to support the ambitious goals around sustainability education that, that Susan just shared with you. So the USI's mandate, so USI is the acronym that I'll be using for the UBC Sustainability Initiative. So the USI's mandate is to inspire UBC students, faculty, and staff to act as sustainability agents of change, responding to the planet's most urgent challenges through education, partnerships, and community engagement. So one of, when the USI was formed, one of the key recommendations for advancing sustainability education on campus was to develop and create a faculty fellowship program. So as I said before, this program was launched in 2010, the same year that the USI was established. And it really is our central model for working with faculty to imagine, to plan and deliver exceptional sustainability related learning opportunities for our students. So the fellowship program annually convenes a group of faculty members who meet monthly to learn from each other, to share their ideas and to work on individual and group projects. So the program is open to all faculty members at the UBC Vancouver campus. And over the past uh, 11 years, we've had 46 individuals from 26 departments and over eight faculties participate in the program. And many of our, our faculty fellows have chosen to come back and, and participate over multiple years. So this photo here that you see on your screen is of our 2018-2019 cohort. That year we actually had 12 uh, faculty members in the fellows program, if you are missing from this photo. Um, and as I said before, we meet monthly, typically over lunch, we share food and we have our discussions. That was in pre-COVID times. So this past year, this is what our faculty fellows program has looked like. We still meet monthly uh, over Zoom and on sunny days and um, when we can make it work, we also go out into the forest uh, to have chats uh, in a physically distanced manner. So what I'd like to do before we dive into the um, program evaluation is just give you a little bit of an overview of how the faculty fellows program has evolved over time. So during the first four years from 2010 to 2014, we hosted an annual cohort of five faculty members. It was a competitive process. They applied to work with us and their job was to work with us to answer this question, like how can USI uh, best support the institution to achieve its ambitious uh, goals around sustainability education. Then um, Susan will describe um, after this slide, she'll go into a bit more detail about what the outcomes were of that first phase. So after that first phase, we felt like a strong enough foundation had been laid for the institution that we could use our financial resources towards empowering faculty members to build out sustainability learning pathways within their home units, departments, and faculties. So from 2014 to 2018, we developed the Pathway Grant Program, which these were curriculum grants 
that were awarded to faculty who wanted to build programs. And then those faculty members also had to commit to being a member of the faculty fellowship program, again, to come together with their peers meeting monthly to share ideas. So after this um, period of running the pathway grant program for a number of years, we decided to conduct a program evaluation of the fellowship program because we wanted to explore some unexpected learning from these first two stages of the program. So it appeared that through participation as fellows, faculty members were developing new relationships and strengthened their roles as champions for sustainability education in their home units. And so to really better understand what the fellows program was achieving beyond its intended goals, we conducted a study based on social network theory. And Susan will be providing an overview of this work in a couple minutes. So then our third phase of the fellows program is the one that we're currently in, is again based on a curriculum grant model, but we are now supporting curriculum grants that um, are awarded to pairs of faculty members to develop new courses and programs that bridge disciplines. And again, the, if you are awarded a faculty member that is awarded a grant, then you also commit to being a fellow. So now we're just going to go into a bit more depth about each phase of the fellowship program. And Susan, over to you. Thanks, Dean. I was, of course, part of the first inaugural uh, think tank of five fellows. I was actually part of the Pathways Fellows as well. Uh, so I was one of those returning folks. I can report that in this initial think tank um, experience, it was really intellectually engaging and um, a most enjoyable and productive experience. And I mean, I was a, I was a strong supporter, but I think all the five original uh, folks in that cohort that I met would say the same thing. I think that's because for the first time in my career, I found myself in serious conversations about sustainability with colleagues who were not from my home discipline, from engineering. We found that we needed to negotiate meaning. Uh, so for example, you know, systems thinking to one person was not the same as systems thinking to another. And remember this was in 2010. So it, it wasn't common language across uh, uh, practice. Um, and similarly with change agency and even sustainability. So we had lots of conversations about that. And it was really useful because it helped us develop the language that we then could use when we went back to our home units to have you know, informed conversation about sustainability education. Uh, we were charged with recommending, as Jean has already explained, to the university, to the USI, how to implement and support sustainability education. And we ended up, as a result, developing a set of graduating student sustainability attributes, which you'll see on the following slide, as well as, I guess, examples of learning pathways situated in different faculties. So we told little stories about students uh, who might be starting in science and how they would, by the end of their um, degree program, achieve the attributes that we described. Other outcomes uh, from think tank cohorts included uh, piloting an introductory interdisciplinary sustainability course, white papers documenting, you know, the unique challenges inserting sustainability content into large first year classes and ideas about uh, developing a cross-disciplinary sustainability learning community for undergraduate students. Thanks so much, Susan. So as uh, I just provided a sketch of the next phase of our fellows, fellows program was the pathway grant phase. So these grants are well, were, we're no longer offering them, but were two year <laughs> curriculum grants up to $20,000 per project. And they were awarded to faculty members to develop and build out these sustainability learning pathways within their home department or faculty. And so I just wanna speak a little bit more about these graduating attributes that Susan spoke about just now. So a couple of things. First, we, we define at UBC a sustainability learning pathway as a collection of sustainability oriented courses and experience that provides students with a firm grounding in these four UBC student sustainability attributes that the, the first cohort, uh, first few cohorts of fellows in the think tank phase developed. 
So the image here that looks a little bit like a bullseye is just really illustrating that concept that a sustainability learning pathway, once a student has graduated from this experience, they should be grounded in sustainability knowledge related to their home discipline. They should have developed an awareness of their own disciplinary lens with respect to sustainability and also have an appreciation for interdisciplinary approaches and other disciplinary perspectives and lenses. They should also have had experience taking their theoretical knowledge and applying it in the real world. So that's the acting for positive change attribute. And then finally, as Susan also mentioned, they should be grounded in systems thinking. So this is, um, and what's, and I'll just move on to the next slide because what I think we're really proud of about the pathway grant phase is that the, the foundation that the early fellows had laid really kind of um, resulted in these new curriculum options for students. And so there are seven examples on this slide. So during that period of 2014 to 2018, we awarded seven grants. And I'm just going, these are the outcomes of those seven grants. And I just want to point out um, a couple. So the second to last bullet here is a new minor in sustainable food systems that was developed through the grant. And this minor is now fully operational. Uh, it launched a couple of years ago. And what's very unique about it is that it is open to all undergraduate students in the Faculty of Science at UBC and also in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. The second example that I wanted to quickly share is that um, we had a few uh, faculty members from education work with us for a few years and they developed a new education for sustainability cohort in UBC's teacher education program. And that cohort has been fully subscribed since it launched a number of years ago as well. So these are the real kind of tangible curriculum outcomes that resulted from this phase of the program. Yeah, maybe if I could just, when I'm looking at that slide there, Gina, I, I think it's also worth mentioning, you know, just to emphasizing, you know, those are five pathways, seven pathways that are now being used in five different faculties across campus. So there really was a breadth of application there. So it was an amazing achievement on the part of Gene and the USI. Um, at, after the Pathways program, as, as Gene has already um, mentioned, there, I, don't, I guess it's fair to say there was a bit of a pause as we kind of looked at what had been achieved and what, what the next step, if any, there would be for the fellows program. So, um, so Jean and I took the time, I guess, to reflect on what, was, what had uh, occurred up until about 2017 and to um, look at the data that had happened, uh, that had been generated, the outcomes, uh, so we, we saw the, you know, um, the white papers, the journal papers, the curricula um, uh, that had been developed. And when we looked at um, the exit interviews that Jean did every year, it seemed clear, and, and just thinking about our own personal experiences, it seemed clear that the fellows were, had achieved all these sort of tangible outcomes, but there was sort of anecdotes suggesting some sort of um, but intellectual development and, and sort of um, uh, other kind of benefits that had accrued to the uh, faculty members as a result of being teaching fellows. They reported uh, that they greatly valued the program, that it enabled discussions with colleagues from outside their disciplines, and that was extremely useful to them, that it broadened their perspective on both sustainability and, and as well as on teaching and learning, um, and that it also supported the formation of relationships which positively imp impacted their sustainability education practice and their careers more broadly. You know, they were able to call on people to bring in guest lectures into their, their courses. They were able to go to um, folks that maybe were at a different stage in their career, you know, junior folks could go to senior folks who were outside of their faculty and ask for advice on various things. So, so Jean and I wondered if we might explore and even ex assess this, this more indirect influence that the USI had had. Next slide, please. 
We turned to a body of research available in the scholarship of teaching and learning literature that employs social network theory to explain how scholarly teaching is propagated or can be propagated through academic units in a university. Um, and I guess, I guess there's a shout out to the authors of this, this work, including Roxa and Martinson and Williamson and others. Um, we provide um, references to the, those on the slide. Um, here we won't go into this interesting body of literature in any detail, except to give you a bit of a snapshot of what we learned. And we're doing that by showing this one uh, um, image that comes from Williamson's et al. Uh, 2013 work. Um, the gist of the, 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 the work as a whole is that trust relationships between different people within academia creates an environment where ideas related to teaching and learning can flourish. And so if one can support and, and promote and sort of foster that um, environment, then good things happen in terms of teaching and learning. In the diagram you see before you, um, the Williamson and, and colleagues have uh, kind of described the academia in terms of three different power levels. The micro power level, which involves conversations and groups of people within departments, for example. The meso layer, which are really these sort of um, um, intermediate managers like department heads, and then the macro layer, which is the upper level of university administration. And the diagram is meant to say that in information flows not only between micro groups within departments, but also between micro groups within departments and other on the ground um, units, and also between those, those groups and meso layer players, and all of these relationships reinforce one another, um, including relationships at the macro uh, level. So um, Jean and I wondered if a similar model could help explain the indirect benefits of the Teaching Fellows program um, that you've heard about and that we heard about in the exit interviews. Um, and I mean by that, perhaps the Fellows program enabled networks to be formed, social networks to be formed between micro clusters, small groups of people, and across meso layer people, like involving uh, department heads. For example, perhaps being in the fellows program enabled individual fellows to create relationships between people within different university departments. These relationships might then help to establish meso layer relationships, perhaps between two or more department heads. Um, so I'm hoping that that sort of starts to sound familiar to you. In 2018, we conducted interviews with nine of the 18 fellows who were active or had completed the program. A small set of examples of the compiled information uh, we collected is shown on the right-hand side of this slide. So um, basically we heard that most of the um, fellows found that their experiences had influenced their sustainability teaching and learning practice, phew, and um, also that their experience in the program had influenced their social networks as it relates to their teaching and learning practice. It was clear from the interviews that all fellows benefited from their USI um, experiences um, in sort of spin-off ways. Next slide, please. Once we had sorted all the interview information uh, from the nine folks we interviewed, we made a stab at sort of interpreting or kind of making sense of the information in terms of what the USI might do in the future to reinforce or maybe even enhance the indirect benefits of the Teaching Fellows Program. We created a list of potential actions based on what we learned from those interviews. And then we convened a workshop attended by just a small number of the fellows, some of whom had participated in the interviews, some, whom, some of whom had not, who basically validated what we thought we had heard from the uh, interview information and uh, validated our list of potential action items the USI might take in moving ahead to in the, you know, in the next round of what the fellows 
program might look like. And here you see the three top ranked ideas uh, that the USI might take to magnify the social relationships that support sustainability education at UBC. In other words, that really start to change the education culture at UBC such that sustainability is a core feature of it. So the ideas were to create opportunities for relationship building between fellows from different faculties, explicitly state the expectation that fellows uh, entering the program need to work on becoming sustainability hubs, thereby providing sustainability information and coaching others within their uh, micro networks. So, you know, you might think about those within their, uh, the people that they know in their own um, program department, their, their academic unit. Because remember the USI and all these meetings are taking in a, are, are taking place in an extra academia sort of environment in an administrative um, group rather than some sort of academic group. So they can, individuals can go back to their academic group and sort of talk about what they've learned. And then they also, I said that yes, meeting monthly and ensuring a mixture of uh, senior as well as junior faculty members was critical to, to propagating sustainability education across campus. Next slide. Thanks so much, Susan. So as Susan just described, the learning that we came away with from this study really helped inform the design of the third uh, phase of the fellows program, which we're currently in. So this um, desire and to cultivate relationships across faculties was part of the driving um, force behind developing the interdisciplinary edu education grants. So not only did we want to um, offer curriculum grants to support faculty members to develop interdisciplinary courses and programs, but our motivation was also to provide these grants so that pairs of faculty members from different backgrounds would have to do this work together. And so we have, we're now in our third, just finishing our third cohort of this phase. And what's been really fantastic about it is that we've been able to offer six grants a year and each grant for each grant, you need at least two faculty members, again, from different academic backgrounds to co-apply together and co-lead the projects. So our annual cohort size has doubled, more than doubled. So now we have 12 faculty members a year in our fellows program who again, meet monthly. Uh, they share their work on their projects, on their curriculum projects, and also they share their ideas, their challenges, and they can co-create new projects and work on um, new ideas as they emerge from the group. So I want to highlight just a couple of the projects to give you a sense of what the grants are actually supporting from a curriculum perspective. Um, we have one that is entering its second year right now that is a collaboration between um, arts and science and they're developing a climate change certificate uh, for undergraduate students. And this certificate will likely be, um, the design phase will be completed this coming year and then it will go to Senate for approval. And the end goal uh, is to make this certificate available to all undergraduate students in arts and science, which is um, the two largest faculties that we have at the University of British Columbia. So um, we are, the other thing that I would say is the other design elements um, were informed by what Susan just mentioned. So not only are we trying to bring together folks from across different disciplines, but we were very intentional of making sure that we brought in senior faculty members. Also, if we could, those that had some administrative experience under their belts, as well as more junior or early career faculty members so that that informal kind of mentorship could take place. And then as Susan also said, we find because we're an administrative unit that these conversations take place um, outside of any academic department or academic faculty. And we've heard again, even just this year, we just wrapped up this year that some of our fellows so appreciate and value that because they're in a high trust environment with us. They feel like they have the freedom um, and, and also have developed the trust with their other faculty members to really have very open, constructive conversations that might be more challenging to have if they were in their home departments. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, maybe I'd like to add a little bit to that too, Jean, now that I'm you know, hearing what you're saying, because this is the first time we've gone through this, <laughs> that, um, I, you know, we talked about what we learned from our study, but sort of extra to that, I think Jean and I also acknowledged that between the period of when we started 2010 and 2017, it became very clear that to really enact sustainability, you really need to be able to communicate and work with people from outside your discipline. And we acknowledge that for faculty members, this is actually very difficult because their sort of identity is, is as an expert within their discipline. And so how can you kind of help them move out toward uh, a more broad experience? And, and, and at the same time for the students, you know, it's important that the faculty model sustainability behavior. And so having them come together with people that are not like themselves from different disciplinary backgrounds in front of the students through these, the curriculum development that they've done really reinforces that need, that understanding that sustainability must involve that, what we now understand to be those transdisciplinary conversations and behaviors. So, so we, we, we kind of overlaid that, I think that's fair to say, in addition to acknowledging what we learned from our, our study. Thanks for that, Susan. I think that's a, a great comment. So I'll go to the next slide now. Yep, that's great. So this is, I guess, our last slide. And, and I, just to summarize what we've reviewed so far, we, we conducted in-depth interviews um, with 50% of the fellows who had been fellows in the 2014, actually, to tw- sorry, 2010 to 2017 period. We then viewed the interview information from those interviews through the lens of social network theory described in the scholarship of teaching and learning literature. And I've given, and uh, Roxa and Martinson from 2015 is one paper that was particularly relevant. And the Williams and, and et al. group from 2013 was also really valuable. As a result, we believe that intangible benefits of the Sustainability Fellows programs are the relationships that form between faculty members who come from different disciplines, different academic units, and at different power levels within the institutions. These relationships can bear conversations that change teaching practice such that sustainability becomes embedded in the education culture of the institution. I've started to think, never underestimate the value of one conversation. So our exploration of this Sotl Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Literature reveals the similarities between the challenge of achieving UBC's goal of ensuring that every student, graduate and undergraduate, has the opportunity to follow a sustainability education pathway, and that this is similar to the challenge of creating a culture of teaching and learning scholarship generally. So that subtle lit body of literature is applicable to our situation. Based on our experiences, um, then we've sort of come to the idea that if you are interested in reinforcing the transition of your institution's culture to embrace sustainability education, uh, we have some recommendations. Um, And firstly, I mean, do consult the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Literature and consider connecting with teaching and learning experts in your institution. You know, you may be able to piggyback on their efforts. Um, When we sort of looked at the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Literature, and actually the Williams et al. are the folks that come from UBC, we found that although the start of the Fellows Program predates the recommendations found in the Sotl literature to incentivize and support formal clusters of educators, our experience in this sustainability teaching fellows program completely aligns with that recommendation. So if you are thinking of creating your own fellows like program, we recommend that each fellows cohort is composed of faculty members from different disciplines and different academic units thereby fostering cross-disciplinary learning and discussion, that each cohort has either a collective responsibility or each individual's responsibilities are connected to a goal shared by the entire cohort. So that then makes meeting together once every month sort of reasonable. You actually want to talk to these people because they're going to help you achieve your, your your, your job. 
Um, and then three, that the cohort is composed of a mix of well-established and newer faculty, which then allows for informal mentoring. You know, ideally the fellowship has one or more senior faculty members with administrative experience, you know, former deans or associate deans or VPs or some such, which then helps to ground all the discussions in the realm of reality. And I think we also uh, recommend that um, there be a strong organizational support from an administrative unit like the USI, whose leaders like Jean foster collabor collaboration and trust. So this is as opposed to being within an academic unit where, which tends to foster quite healthy competition, but competition nonetheless. Um, we also recommend that there is financial support to enable fellows to fully participate and, divert, uh, and devote their time to, to the projects at hand and equally to feel valued by the university. Um, we also recommend that a signal of the value of the fellowship um, program uh, would be aligning that participation with the tenure and promotion process. So the participants know that putting their fellowship activities on their CV is going to help them get, uh, you know, help them go forward in their career. And then finally, um, we would recommend considering the support within the cohort of developing skills and competencies that enable fellows to become hubs or strengthen their roles as hubs within their academic unit, their home academic unit. And we say that because, uh, you know, some of the folks that were coming into the fellows program were junior faculty. They didn't feel they had much status in their academic unit. So if the fellows program can kind of uh, coach them in terms of their developing their leadership capabilities, um, then that enables them to be stronger sustainability education hubs in their programs. So Jean, I think that's about it. I think that's it. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to hear about um, the fellowship program at UBC. We hope that you've um, taken some good learning away from, from this presentation. And again, uh, we apologize that there will not be a live Q&A, um, but we do offer our emails on the screen. So please get in touch with any questions that you have, any follow-up conversations. We would love to hear from you. And uh, again, we really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.